Sure. Um, and, and then first let me uh, introduce Claire. Um, so hi, hi everybody and hi Claire. Um, I'm Annie Gao, I'm uh, the outreach chair of SWIP and the host of this event. Um, and uh, uh, let, let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, Claire Bohm is from U Chicago and she's an alumni of physics department. And she is now a grad student. Um, so we're happy to have Claire talk about herself and her journey in physics. Welcome Claire. Thank you, Annie. Yeah, I figured this would be really chill. I don't know if you guys still do SPS pizza meetings, but um, whenever we did that, when I was an undergrad, it would just be a really chill conversation. So I've prepared essentially nothing except for a list of advice, because <laughs> I know you guys like advice. <laughs> um, and I figured I'd just kind of uh, ramble a little bit. Um, so starting from the very beginning, uh, I was born in Mount Prospect, Illinois, um, and have basically been in Illinois for my whole life and may someday escape, but who knows. <laughs> uh, and the first thing I ever wanted to be was a farmer. I played the game Harvest Moon. I don't know if you guys ever played this game where you're like a little farmer and you plant a farm <laughs> and like raise horses. Um, but I thought that was like the best thing. And we had a garden in the backyard. Um, but uh, farmer dreams pretty much quickly went away in like, I don't know, like third grade or something like that, um, where I wanted to become an author, which is not technically untrue. Um, this did happen. <laughs> I was a co-author on a paper so far. So I guess I can tell my third grade teacher that that was fulfilled. Um, but it, aside from that, like many things had changed. I, I fell in love with like reptiles and amphibians and wanted to be a herpetologist, which studies reptiles and amphibians because um, my whole family was allergic to like cats and dogs. So we went the less furry, more scaly route <laughs> and uh, had fish and frogs and snakes. Um, and I, I'm on a gecko now. Her name is Garrett after a guy in one of my undergrad labs who hated to name things. Um, so ironically, her name's Garrett. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, somewhere in there, like an artist came up, like an architect. So my whole life, I did not know physics right off the bat. Um, if anyone talked to Jesse Shelton, I remember her distinctly saying she was born like wanting to be a physicist. Uh, but that, that was not my story. Um, so I didn't really actually know physics was a thing until high school. Like I didn't know the word for the thing I was interested in, like, cause I like black holes and space and all this kind of cool, like why, why is this the way it is kind of questions. Um, so I uh, attended a lecture at the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, Fermi Lab, um, totally uh, not related to physics at all. It was actually a weather seminar that my dad had found and he's like, oh yeah, Claire might like this. Um, so we went and saw all the like cool outreach posters that Fermilab had of like particles and neutrinos. And I'm like, oh, hey, look, like turns the head, like the, the meme of the like guy walking with the girl and like, yeah, I don't know if <laughs> you guys know that meme. Um, uh, but that was kind of like what started it all. Also, Wilson Hall, if anyone's ever been in there, is like a really fantastic building. It is so cool looking. Um, very involved with nature and uh, outreach and stuff like that. So I kind of found the word of the thing I was looking for. I'm like, physics, like this was it. This was it the whole time. Um, and so like junior, senior year of high school, I uh, started focusing more on math and science and then applied to a number of undergrads for physics and uh, obviously went to UIUC, which was, I think, the best choice. Like, no regrets. Uh, I At the time, I was kind of disappointed because um, I was rejected from UChicago, and I was looking at UChicago for undergrad. But I think UIUC has just, like, a so much better undergrad experience. Um, Y'all seem a lot happier. <laughs> Uh, and also the presence of an engineering school. Um, 
that definitely impacts the overall vibe and you get a lot more hands-on experience in workspaces and mentorship. Um, yeah, so uh, freshman year as a physics major, <laughs> uh, I, I remember walking into the interaction room and seeing like all the big whiteboards with physics on it being like whoa I have no idea what any of this is um, and it seems like kind of like a foreign language uh, and it's kind of cool over the course of four years to see how that foreign language gets deciphered because like as a senior you walk in and you're like oh somebody's doing quantum um, and you like don't really realize how fast that happens or like when that happens um, it's just like a very like sneaky transition um, but uh, ironically, the first day of undergrad, I met like four physicists in my class right off the bat um, at like a total non-physics event, which was kind of hilarious. I know uh, Phil Travis, who's a past SPS president, he's been taunting me that he'll join the last five minutes of this. So <laughs> we'll see if he follows through uh, just to troll us. Um, but he, he is a really good resource too, if you guys have any questions about like machine learning or something like that. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, so as a freshman, I was kind of just like exploring, not really sure what I was doing. I think I, I joined, I became a DJ. Um, so my DJ name was DJ Clairvoyance and I was a DJ for Pizza FM and Pizza FM and had like 10 listeners. Um, and was totally into the electronic music scene. Uh, and yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. It wasn't exactly the DJ experience I was expecting. I was, I, I was expecting like the soundboard with like the light um, pattern thingy and like an audience. <laughs> but uh, I, it was still very fun. Uh, I lived in uh, Hopkins by Eikenberry. They have pretty good food and ironically I that was the year I like didn't work out at all, even though the gym was right behind me. Um, <laughs> and then like senior year, I started working out much more. Uh, and uh, so that was, yeah, a year of very much exploration. Um, just kind of like having fun and figuring out physics. Quad day is a great time, making friends, learning how to actually do laundry, right? Um, <laughs> and then uh, sophomore year, um, Oh, wait, no, no, we got to take a step back to freshman year. Uh, engineering open house that year, and every year actually was pretty lit, but I think the project I did freshman year for EOH was the most dangerous thing I've ever done. <laughs> and it was, um, it, was an, it was a project called the Ionocraft. Um, and this is essentially a, a triangular structure with like, three toothpicks on the corners, like a foil skirt that goes around the bottom and a really thin wire that goes around the top. And you hook up the thin wire at the top to like 20,000 volts. Um, and when you do that, the top wire ionizes the air around it and the ionized particles get thrown down to the grounded skirt and produces thrust and this thing flies. Um, wow. with no moving parts it's literally just like um and i was trying to find some pictures of it because it was a, like a hilarious flying death machine <laughs> like this was really really sketchy <laughs> um uh but like yeah there are many attempts to do this and like the first 10 caught on fire or would like fly and then like floop off the table uh, but we finally got a version to work um and there's maybe still pictures somewhere on the internet of this. Um, but it would fly maybe like a couple inches off the ground for a few seconds and like stop for reasons we still don't know why. Um, and uh, we, the only thing that separated like tiny children and this thing was like a table. So like if you just reached out, you could have touched 20,000 volts and that would have not been good. And I don't know how the safety people didn't catch this but they didn't like my electric pickle. <laughs> um, uh, Wait, really? So that, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I've never heard anything about that. So, um, oh, the electric I've never pickle. heard any complaints. Yeah, they, um, 
they complained to me when I actually tried to file it as a real experiment or a, like real exhibition. Uh, they wanted the they wanted a rating sheet for the pickle, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that doesn't exist. <laughs> what is wait? The what kind of rating sheet? Like uh, like you know how you oh an MSDS. Basically, yeah, something like that for like if you're buying a, a circuit, like a mini circuit online, let's say, and it has like a spec sheet. I think they wanted a spec sheet for the pickled. Um, and uh, I didn't know what to say to that. <laughs> but that's that's sophomore, junior year. Um, yeah, so freshman year Ionocraft was really fun. And no one should do that again uh, without proper safety attire. Um, Yes, I, I strongly encourage safety. Looking back on some things we did in undergrad, it was a little bit more sketched than I would like to admit. Um, yes, yeah, so sophomore year um, was getting kind of into more advanced classes. And uh, for context, so Annie, you're applying to grad school. And I think, Nicholas, you are too. Is that right? Tessa, what year are you? I'm a freshman. <laughs> ah, freshman! Oh man, this is a rough year to be a freshman though. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. so sorry. <laughs> yeah, like part of me is like, I'm glad this is happening my freshman year. So like all my important classes will be in person later on, yeah. but also like not great for like a freshman year experience. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, it'd be best if it never happened at all and you just had a normal freshman year. But yeah, I suppose this is the least inconvenient, yeah year for it to happen. Yeah, so um, sophomore year was the year I became treasurer of SWIFT. Uh, at the time, there was, we were pretty small. We were maybe like, there was like two or three upperclassmen, and then like two or three new students, and we were desperate for people. Um, we were like <laughs> on the brink of essentially fizzling out. So. Uh, when officer elections rolled around, it, we didn't really have elections. It was kind of like positions were just defaulted to people. Um, so I was just like, all right, I guess I'll be treasurer. And um, I don't know if you guys know Meredith Staub, but she was president before me. Um, and yeah. she's, yeah, she's in, uh, I, I think she might have given a talk, didn't she? Is that right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, like yeah. on September, I think. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so we were pretty, pretty tight and tried to like kind of revive Swip a little bit. Um, and I think we did, I think we succeeded. We made it a little bit more spicy. We uh, included more events. That was the year we started Food for Thought at EOH because I think before we had paper circuits, um, but uh, um, yeah, we just wanted a little bit more audience participation. Um, and I should also mention around summer of my freshman year and sophomore year was kind of when I got started in research. Um, and since I was inspired by Fermilab as, an, as a high schooler, I'm like, all right, I want to do high energy physics. Um, and at first I wanted to do high energy theory, not knowing anything about theory and uh, was pretty promptly rejected from that because I was a freshman with no skills in math um, <laughs> and actually had no concept of what that actually really meant. Um, so I ended up working with Kevin Pitts, who is maybe not really in the physics department anymore, but he's like a upper crusty administrator somewhere in UIUC. And he's, he's really awesome. He's a great mentor. Um, so I ended up working on the muon G minus two experiment at Fermilab. And uh, for a couple of weeks, I spent that time uh, scrubbing rust off of old magnets from the experiment. Um, it was oddly satisfying. <laughs> so just go to Fermilab, scrub up the rust, and then they put in the magnets into the experiment. Um, so that was that was a lot of fun in-person stuff. Um, but a lot of the kind of experimental work aside from that was coding. Um, and kind of a year after I started doing research, I realized I don't want to be stuck coding or behind a computer the whole time. So I kind of like slowly backed off from the high energy research. It never officially terminated. I just kind of stopped. <laughs> and I think Kevin Pitts 
my uh, advisor kind of understood that. Um, so it's, it's very nice to have an understanding advisor. Um, and yeah, there was maybe a question about how do you get research as a freshman? Um, you just got to go talk to people this year, particularly is probably fairly hard to do research. Um, I'd say still go ahead and email people. They might have some side projects for you to do, especially simulation work. Um, and if that's not successful for whatever reason, I highly, highly encourage doing your own side project, like buy an Arduino and have some fun with it. Like <laughs> anything regarding Arduino, Python, Mathematica, some simulation work is going to be very, very useful skills, um, very marketable skills for whatever research that is. Yeah, I actually just attended my first lab group meeting today, so. Yes, <laughs> that's so exciting. With who, what, are you, what research are you doing? Um, I'm working with Professor Kim. She's pretty new to the university mm. and it's uh, computational biophysics, then experimental biophysics, but mainly like modeling and stuff comes COVID, so yeah. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah, biophysics yeah. has gotten a lot more popular over the past few years. Um, pretty cool stuff. Um, yeah, so let's see. Yeah, so I was doing research and kind of waned off of research, um, doing swift treasure stuff and exploring other things at the university. Every year I wanted to try a new RSO because I just like to just try random shit. Like I um, did archery for a little while which was really therapeutic. Um, let's see, I can't remember what other RSOs I tried out. I think I tried riding a unicycle, but that just didn't pan out because I wasn't very good. <laughs> so uh, that, that stopped, not enough time for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so food for thought started and um, the summer of my sophomore year was a blast. I went to Japan for study abroad. And I just took this time to immerse myself in something that was non-physics because I was interested in like Japanese culture and language. Ironically, I didn't watch any anime before going, but I started watching anime after coming back from Japan, which I guess I am, I shouldn't be that surprised that that happened. <laughs> so um, that was about seven weeks. And if you get the chance to study abroad or want to, I highly recommend it. It is quite the experience um, for somebody who's been in Illinois for her whole life too and doesn't really know anything outside of the United States firsthand. Um, yes, so that was nice just like getting that change of scenery and then coming back as a junior and senior is when it starts like amping up a little bit. You start thinking about grad school, you start thinking about the GRE. Um, I, and that was the year I became president of SWIFT, um, kind of by default as well. <laughs> so, um, but I, I would have wanted it anyway. It was a, it was a blast and I had great officers. Um, and I think that was the year where we like that, it really had a resurgence that year. SWIFT was, had like 30 people coming as opposed to like three. Um, and I think I might've like overcorrected a little bit because we had like, a ton of men coming like SPS and Swift crowd was essentially the same and like that's fine um but uh yeah I guess it was just like I don't know it, it was fine it was fine by me it was a fun time um so uh let's see junior year I'm trying to think if there's anything noteworthy because I have all these like very oddly specific memories of dumb things we did in SWIP and <laughs> SPS um, and uh, that's honestly like a lot of my fondest memories too. Uh, I think I might have said this once before at a different meeting but um, just like late one night when we were doing homework in Loomis you guys know there's a room entirely filled with blue chairs and there's a room entirely filled with green chairs kind of in that like hallway on the first Not floor. Not anymore. They got no. ripped out to make a grad lounge. The new rooms got ripped out? <laughs> what? All right. Well, uh, they used to 
Wait, 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 wait. We're thinking of the same place, right? It's it's in the IR, the back room. Oh, no, no. This is the first floor. This is, oh, like, oh, the two oh. big lecture halls, and then there's, like, um, like, little rooms behind it where, uh, um, discussions happen, and then there's the hallway, and then there's, like, another main lecture hall for the upper classes. Oh, I think, yeah. Oh, um, I get what you're talking about. The room's about. on either side of that lecture hall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, um, oh, with, like, the, the windows rooms. that you can see into the classroom. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess there's the discussion rooms. Um, so, uh, I don't know if this is still the case, but, uh, they, like, totally renovated those rooms when I was there and put all green chairs in one room and all blue chairs in the other room. So what we would do whenever we were studying is switch out one green chair for a blue chair, like, once a week, and I was hoping to have switched out all of the chairs without anybody noticing (laughs) by, uh, the time I, like, graduated or whatever, but they got reset over Thanksgiving, um. So I gave up, but that <laughs> was one of the dumb things we did. That was just like very fond memory. Uh, there's also lots of sardines played in uh, Loomis where one person hides and everybody else tries to find them. Um, and then we got an email from uh, the department head that says Loomis is not a playground. You should not do that anymore. <laughs> um, but they loved us and we knew they loved us. Um, yeah, like the department head, like Brian DeMarco and um, is it Matias who's actually department head now? Yes. Wait, wait, wait. Was it DeMarco who said that? Because that sounds like something uh, he'd say. No, oh. he would absolutely say it, but um, it was not him at the time. Uh, he may have said yeah, something like... almost word for word the same to us. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised. Like they'll they'll scold you, but they will secretly love you. Like. Uh, I think they're all very fond of SPS and SWIP. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, let's see. So, yeah, junior year happened. I took the GRE at some point very begrudgingly. Um, I was not one to study months beforehand. I intended to, but studied about a week beforehand and just wanted to be so done with it. Um, so I I was like happy enough with my score, so I'm just like, yeah, this is it. And that dog is adorable. Oh my god, he's like a teddy bear. <laughs> yeah, this is our puppy. <laughs> he just ran into the room. So okay. <laughs> oh, what a cutie. Um yeah, so and then um let's see, the the moment I decided to grad school go to grad school was I guess not really any distinct moment um it was more like a feeling starting sophomore year and junior year that I couldn't really see myself doing anything else there wasn't like a strong desire to um go into industry I really wanted to kind of understand physics better because I I knew there was like so much more to understand that I don't feel like I could have grasped as well in industry as in a grad school setting. Um, So I guess summer of my junior year, I was a little bit concerned that like, all right, well, I don't really know what in physics I want to understand more though. Like high energy isn't my thing. Condensed matter physics is cool, but like preparing samples is also maybe not my thing. So I decided to try this uh, AMO scene. Uh, So I did an RIU at the University of Florida and got the best tan of my life um, and also the worst sunburn of my life. Wear sunscreen? Seriously. (laughs) And uh, uh, I, yeah, AMO was just like kind of the thing for me. It was, um, it was the perfect mix of skills. Like you could tinker, you could code, you could do electronics, you could do a little bit of theory. And it was just like all of the skills in that were very appealing to me and they were also very marketable skills so if i decided i don't want to do amo in the future um they're transferable to other fields um which is kind of convenient for me now because i am kind of thinking about that uh so amo highly recommend i was also inspired by somebody saying um instead of like learning about all the particles in the universe like neutrons and whatever uh, a cern 
they're just like all photons all the time I'm like <laughs> yeah <laughs> photons all the time we're literally so many lasers um yeah so after my RU, I was pretty set like yeah i want to apply for amo um so i applied for a bunch of schools 10 uh 10 schools with some reach schools some kind of safety schools and then some kind of in between and uh uh, I say this like it was so easy. No, like this took forever and like hours of labor and like classes were happening and life was happening. And uh, I'm sure you guys understand this. <laughs> um, yep. Yeah. Um, so in the end, it boiled down to Colorado at Boulder and U Chicago. Uh, Colorado at Boulder is basically the AMO capital of the United States. So I'm like, that would be a really good place for me to go for AMO. Um, but like, if I didn't like AMO, they really, their strong suit is definitely in AMO and I don't know what else I would really do. Um, now, on the other hand, you Chicago, they didn't like have a ton of AMO groups. Um, it was the group I'm in now, which is John Simon's lab. And then like a couple other labs. And so I'm like, okay, well, uh, if I don't like my advisor, like I don't have any options aside from that, but like there are other AMO options. Um, but I, yeah, so like it was neck and neck between the two, but the thing that tipped the scales was my PI because uh, PI was at the top of my priorities list. Um, they say, I think Celia Elliott might say this, um, the two most important people in your life are your spouse and your PI. <laughs> which is not untrue because you're spending potentially up to seven years with somebody who is going to vouch for you and you're going to look up to for support and uh, guidance and you want to make sure they're good and sometimes it's hard to kind of tell in the very beginning if that's going to be a fit or not but you just got to go based off a of feeling and make sure you have a backup option if it doesn't pan out um, so fortunately for me I had good vibes about the group and the PI and it worked out. So the first year here, it was like a little intimidating because I have had like very little AMO experience um, and my advisor is a little bit of an intense person. Um, so I'm like, I don't know if this is gonna work out, but then it, time, time told it, it would. So um, I'm very happy about that. It kind of worked out easy for me. For other people, sometimes it doesn't um, like, for other people, it takes maybe two years where you're teaching and you're trying to search around other groups. Um, and it's, it's all like super normal. So if it, you find yourself doing that, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so now I, I decided to go to UChicago, the only school in the Midwest I applied to. And I'm still in Illinois <laughs> and the weather is still the same. And it's snowing today. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm very happy I'm here. Um, my family's in the area and I kind of underestimated how nice it would be to have them around and see them, especially if my sister is gonna start a family, get to see youngins grow up. Um, and I'll be the coolest aunt because I'll be the only aunt. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I guess grad school, I didn't really, like, I kind of tried to understand what grad school would be like as a pre-grad student, which, like, I kind of got a feeling of, but you don't really know until you're here. Or maybe I should say that more about myself. Like, I didn't really know what it was like until I was here, um, like, how the whole thing goes. It felt kind of unstructured, like, with the whole, oh, you take classes for maybe like two or three years thing, but I'm like, I want more definition than that. Like, uh, like classes for one or two or three, uh, and when are you done? But really it does vary per university. Um, so I anticipate, I'll probably graduate in something like six years and I'm a fourth year now. Um, and I'm all done with my classes as of about a year ago, which is so freeing. It's amazing. Um, but you get other life stressors because um, it, you get like kind of real life deadlines now. <laughs> and um, you, you have people 
somewhat depending on you. So instead of doing a, a problem set and like you don't do it yourself, you're only like really letting yourself down. But now if I don't do something, I'm letting my group down. Um, so it's a different kind of feeling, different kind of stress, but it's it's good. I'm very happy with where I am. Um, and uh, I think the overall university has good vibes and good people. Um, of course, things can always be improved, but <laughs> I'm a happy camper. Um, do you guys have anything, any questions? This is the very general outline sketch of my life. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess we can talk about the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tessa or Nicholas, do you guys have questions? It's also fine if you don't. I'll just keep rambling after I drink some tea. Actually, um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have never done the experiment before. Um, is that so? In my imagine, experiment is just like. You go to lab and you play with the apparatus and it takes like one day or half a day. Is that also include some coding or is data analysis actually an experiment or theory? Uh, data analysis for us is we consider it experiment. Um, and we do do a little bit of, uh, I would say, not janky theory, but um, less formal theory to classify our system but the process of taking data analyzing it and trying to understand the system is very very interconnected i think i would say i do every one of those things or try to do every one of those things once a day um, or whenever there's new data um so it's it, honestly most of the time experiment for me has been kind of like debugging because um, you can have a concept which in your mind takes like two seconds, um, but to actually implement it and work out all the like little engineering challenges that come up on the way, it takes a lot of time. Um, so like, for example, we want to set up a new laser path that shoots the atoms in this way. Um, and so we have to buy the laser, make sure to set it up, make sure it's the correct wavelength, make sure that the frequency stabilized, make sure it uh, goes through the right path and the right wave plates to make it the right polarization. Um, make sure it couples into our optical cavity just right, um, because that's fairly important. Um, and then also you need atoms in the cavity too. So you need another laser beam for that and like things just keep piling up. And there's no wonder all these AMO experiments look like heckin' complicated because um, I, the first time I ever saw an AMO experiment I don't know if you guys have, uh, but it looks like a table with like a butt ton of mirrors and lenses and what have you. And uh, before you get into it, it's just like, why is all of this necessary? This seems so extra. <laughs> and it really, every single mirror is needed. Uh, maybe, maybe that's not quite true, but... Um, you can kind of learn to trace out the paths and say, oh, like this light is undergoing these changes to do this thing. And like, oh, that's why we need this many things. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool to see how that process comes together. Uh, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, so, so coding is also a big part of the experience. Yeah, coding is a huge part. We do lots of Python. Um, so there's coding in kind of two senses. There's the sense of analysis of the data that you collect, and then there's also the sense of running your experiment. So um, for a lot of AMO experiments, you'll need some sort of software to make sure your experiment runs just right. So like all the lasers turn on at um, the same or different times for very specified time intervals. Um, and so we have a home-based program out of Python that does all of that. Um, and as a grad student, you need to know that program pretty much inside and out so you can update it and debug it and change it as needed um, for when you implement new things. Because it's, it's very much an ever-changing monster. Um, and I think AMO is different from a lot of fields in that kind of sense because this is, you are the master of your own domain. like. 
this experiment is yours and like you know it and potentially nobody else in the world knows it um so it's intimidating but nice to be like i want to change this thing who should i collaborate with to figure out if this needs to happen let me ask myself for two seconds yes claire i would like to do this and then you just go and change it <laughs> instead of collaborating with like a million other um people at cern for example um yeah so that's that's nice we get to make janky electronics um, yes, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about um, the future from here because it's never too early to start thinking about the future. Um, and uh, the future is maybe two years away. So after grad school, in my mind, there are kind of three major paths. Um, you go on to a postdoc, um, you go on to industry. Um, well, I guess there are two major paths with the first one eventually maybe leading to a professorship. So it kind of like branches into two and then one branch branches into two again. Um, so if you do a postdoc, there's no, you don't make a commitment to staying in academia. Um, but usually after your postdoc, you either do continue on to academia or you continue off into something else like industry um, or like a teaching position to a, a, a university or something at a national lab. Um, and then Alternatively, you could go into industry um, and maybe I lied again. Maybe there is a third branch where you just like go off and do something else entirely. Like some people go off and do law um, and like all of these things are very like they're common. Like you, you should do whatever you want, like do the thing that you want to do and pursue your own passion and never get caught up in things that you think you should be doing. Um, like, oh, I'm in physics. I should be a physicist, but like there's no requirement on that. Uh, and then maybe that's me. Maybe that's a statement of my own uh, self impositions that I've imposed on myself over the years. Um, but uh, lately, I've been thinking about leaving academia. Um, I've actually never intended to stay in academia, but that could change. Um, and going off into industry as some sort of scientist possibly labeled an engineer. Um, and I would like to explore the field of brain machine interfaces um, because I think it pretty much, it's inevitable and is really freaking cool. Like um, the things they're doing now, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but they're um, like essentially implanting electrodes into people's brains, uh, people who are paralyzed and um, they can control a computer mouse on a screen. And if you take that further, uh, it, like if you just think about, OK, so where could this go? You could bring this next to people who can't move in a wheelchair and put them in a mecha suit, and now they can move. Um, or you could take this further and think, OK, what if I stimulate my ocular cortex, and now I can watch a movie in my head without any external stimuli? Um, or you could take this further and have uh, an extension to your brain where you can now remember things flawlessly um, and just like have like a computational center in your brain. This is almost sounding like sci-fi, but I honestly think this is like such an interesting field because um, it kind of does border on what I'm used to being in sci-fi, but it's happening. Um, and I think the skills in AMO are very nicely transferable because like, it's electronics. I'm going to be taking a machine learning course online, um, which, yeah, machine learning, good skill there. Um, <laughs> if you want to kill some time, you should just go for it. Take a course. Um, uh, yeah, nanofabrication, which um, isn't like strictly an AMO thing that happens, but there are people in tangentially related things that do nanofab. Um, that's a very useful thing to know. And it's pretty cool because like a lot of modern technology relies on it. Everything in your phone um, fabricated. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of like the technology of the future. Um, so yeah, it's, I would say this is a really exciting time to be alive and it's a good time to be in science. So I hope you guys are excited too. I know it's different for people at different stages and when you're an undergrad, the thing that is most pressing is homework assignments and tests that are right around the corner. Um, 
but uh, eventually you reach a point where real life kind of happens and you're like, wow, like a lot of the fields of physics aren't so separate and there's a lot of crisscrosses and interdisciplinary things and the sky is really the limit. Um, so that's why I say do the thing that like you want to do because like you can carve your own path no problem you might need some mentorship but <laughs> um don't be afraid to do it even if you're the only one doing it um so yeah this leads me to my list of advice which um is really just advice that i thought of in a three-hour car ride about a couple days ago <laughs> um so i'm just gonna go for it unless you guys have any questions because this is a good time for questions. Anybody have more questions? <laughs> the things you want to talk about? Nah, I want to hear the advice first. <laughs> yeah, so this is probably on the line, along the lines of um, kind of general advice. And I'm not going to say anything like, you should take physics 404. But you also should do that <laughs> if you haven't already. Um, have fun. I think that's very important. Um, if you're not having fun and if you're not happy with where you are, uh, that's very telling about your situation and maybe it should be changed. Um, change is okay. Um, <laughs> you know, the second thing, I actually don't remember putting this on here, but I say, uh, don't be a dick. So that's true. Um, <laughs> but that's, I guess, advice I have for you. Uh, do the things that scare you. So this one is pretty hard. And I'm not talking about like jumping in a pit of alligators. I'm talking about if you're asked to give um, the graduation speech and you're like, oh, God, no, you should be saying, oh, God, yes, I will do it. Um, <laughs> because. Uh, those kind of things will help you grow as a human being. Um, read your email, which I'm assuming you guys do since you're here. Um, but there are some little tidbits that float into email every once in a while where you're like, hey, this could actually be kind of useful. Um, uh, get cozy with Python and Mathematica and the Arduino, especially if you're an experimentalist. Um, I guess theory is maybe not necessarily quite the same advice, but um, those are all very good things, marketable things. And um, if you're young, like a freshman, they will only help you. Um, also the Raspberry Pi, Raspberry Pis are very cool. Uh, and enthusiasm goes a long way. Um, so if you ever feel like you don't know enough for like, um, I don't know, let's say you're like interviewing for a job, um, Enthusiasm really leaves an impression on people. So keep that in mind. Um, let's see. Uh, in terms of deciding what grad school to go to or what not to go to, um, if you're between two, um, imagine yourself at one place. Would you regret not have going to the other place? Um, so I guess a way you can think about your choice is what would you regret not doing instead of the thing that you regret doing. So this is, yeah, this is all just kind of general. Um, let's see, it's okay to take breaks. <laughs> so uh, oftentimes I feel like there's this push to like keep working, keep working, keep working. And I guess sometimes breaks cannot be afforded, um, but if you can afford to take the break, you should absolutely do it because you'll come back hopefully with a more fresh mind um side projects are great um if you have something that's of particular interest to you i'd say go ahead and tinker um so i don't know i made this uh table called an infinity mirror table um, where if you look down into it it looks like you're gonna drop your glass into an abyss or something um it's a piece of partially reflective glass and a mirror about an inch below it and then uh, led lights around the inside gap so it gives that like bathroom mirror effect of infinity. Um, it's really cool. I, I was very pleased with it. 
Um, it took me like two years to make, but um, that's two years of procrastination and actually really only four days. <laughs> um, advocate for yourself. Um, so I, I guess that's more or less saying like stand up for yourself. Like y'all are competent. Don't forget it. Um, there will be lots of people who um, might be people who kind of dominate the conversation, um, but like, stay strong, <laughs> believe in yourself and uh, assert yourself. Um, yeah, it's never too early to start thinking about your future. Take advantage of free stuff. Um, so in Loomis, there's like free shit lying around um, <laughs> on like tables and hallways and stuff. Um, check it out. You might find some cool things, especially if you're part of SPS or Swift for EOH projects. Um, working out is very good. I didn't follow this advice until I was in grad school and realized, oh my god, I haven't been doing this the whole time and should have been. Because um, it really improves my mental health. Um, uh, and don't underestimate the therapeutic benefits of feeding ducks. That was the end of my advice list. <laughs> um. Sorry, this is at your last that, that I was muted. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I have a question. Oh yeah, about the the workout. Um, do you what, what's your what's your favorite way of working out, like jogging or? I love to swim. I love swimming. And it's so hard to get to the pool. Uh, but recently at home, there's these home workout videos by these people called The Body Project. Um, they're pretty good. They remind me of like some 80s colorful workout with like, uh, the like leg warmers and stuff like that. It reminds me of that, but it's not that. Quite effective. Cool. Um, yeah. Anybody have questions? Has a Nicholas? Tell me about um, you guys. I have no idea what you're talking about uh, about free stuff laying on Bloomus. Is there for, not for free EOH. Stuff? Um, I, I have to deny it. Free stuff. Okay, okay. You have to deny it as in you know there's free stuff, but you're denying it? No, I'm denying ever taking, ever taking free stuff. Oh, yes, I see, yes. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. I, I will start, uh, I'll pause uh, recording here.